Uh, I want to talk tonight just on uh, on a topic, and, and I'm just you guys just bear with me a little bit uh, as I try to lay some groundwork here. I'm going to talk about resilient resolutions. Resilient resolutions. Let's pray. I, I, I want the Holy Spirit uh, to have His way in this place tonight. Um, this has been uh, a, a message that I felt like I wanted to, like the Lord wanted me to preach here, but I'll be, I'll be honest, I struggled with it. I, I've struggled with uh, preaching this tonight, and so uh, I just need the Holy Spirit to show up, because if he doesn't show up, this is going to be a really mediocre TED Talk, so, and I don't want to waste you all people's time, so uh, we're going to pray and just let God have his way. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, let's pray together. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for this tremendous spirit of worship that's in this house. I thank you, Lord God, for giving me the opportunity, this platform, to speak what I feel like you've given to me, uh, to share what I feel like your spirit is telling me with this house. And so, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, come. Have your way in this place. Move and minister. Touch, uh, touch hearts. Touch lives, God. We just pray for breakthrough. Uh, a spirit of breakthrough to flood this house, a spirit of healing, a spirit of clarity, a spirit uh, of deliverance, just be in this house, God, and anoint me just to communicate uh, what I feel like you've laid on my heart, God, help me to do a good job in a short amount of time, um, and we just thank you, Lord, for your blessings. At the end of the day, God, uh, uh, you're going to get all praise and glory, and we want to celebrate you, Lord, in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. When, when I say resolution, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? What's the first word? What's that? TV. TV picture? Oh, you went a totally different direction than I was thinking. I, I, that's, that's awesome, but I say, I say resolution, and the first thing that pops in my head is New Year's, right? Does anybody make New Year's resolutions? It's all right. We can wave hands. It's okay. It's church. You're supposed to have fun. Uh, I, I like to make New Year's resolutions. I don't live to any of them, but I like to make them right? I mean, one year, my wife and I, I was just goofing off. I, I told her, this year, my resolution is I want to master Sean Connery's accent. Uh, I, I'm not going to try that right now because it didn't work. Um, I, I, you know, a couple years ago, I made a resolution that I was going to lose weight and get in shape. I, I did nothing different, and I gained 15 pounds. I, I don't think that's how a resolution is supposed to work. I'm not the brightest. I just, I don't think that's how a resolution goes. I, I watched some YouTube videos. It's amazing. You can watch a ton of YouTube videos and not get any better cardio at all. It's really, it, it's weird. I think it's false advertisement. I figured once I watched 10 videos, I'd be, I could see an ab or something, but nothing. Um, it's amazing how resolutions work uh, in, in our society. We think of resolutions as something that uh, uh, we, we hope will happen. Um, you know, I'm really going gonna, really gonna to get on track, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to learn this new skill. I'm going to do something. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, this is not that. When I talk about resilient resolutions, this is not a New Year's resolution. The, the, the biblical word for resolution actually means to put or to place, to set, to lock your knees and stand firm. And, and we see this in, in Scripture in, in Daniel chapter 8. For, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible talks about Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile his way. Daniel, in this text, in the context that we're, we're talking about resolution, he sets his feet. He sets his mind. He sets his will. Every essence of his being is locked in, and this is the line that he's not going to cross. And, and, and so we read that, we gloss over that text, and it's like, man, that's great. But, but there's a backstory. There's a backstory behind Daniel setting his feet. Because you see, Daniel, Daniel is a young boy. He's probably a preteen when the, the Babylonians invade and, and conquer Israel. Which means that Daniel, for the first part of his life, as a young boy, he grew up in an Israel that was not oppressed and not conquered. It's important that you grasp that because his formative years, the most earliest memories that he has is an Israel that is free from any kind of ruler. And as a Hebrew boy growing up in that era, his parents no doubt invested hours in teaching him the law. 
telling him stories of the children of Israel, growing up hearing stories of Adonai and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hearing about the exodus from Egyptian rule, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, how the children of Israel uh, wandered in the wilderness, wilderness, but God was faithful, and he provided manna for them. And this is the most, these, these are the earliest impressions of a young boy that's growing up in Israel, and he has an identity as a young boy of who God is and how God operates. We are the chosen people of Israel. We are, we are God's chosen people. God spoke a promise over us, and we are blessed, and God's going to multiply us as, as, the, as the grains of sand in the, in the desert. We're going to be great, and God has done all these marvelous works, and he's done all these He's delivered us from enemy time and time again, and, we, and he, he can tell stories almost as good as his parents about Joshua and the battle of Jericho, and he can talk about different aspects of David because it was told to him through stories over supper time. Hey, his parents would, let me tell you about God. Let me tell you about Yahweh. And as a little boy, those stories, oftentimes I'm sure his parents, they put him to bed telling him stories about God. And he, he had a mindset of who God was and how God operates as it pertains to his reality, even though he's a little boy. And then Babylon invades. And Israel is overrun. Jerusalem's destroyed. And in an instant, his whole world is shattered and flipped on its head. Have you ever had a mindset about something that you knew was 100% true, and then life <laughs> blows in and completely flips you upside down? You ever knew how something was supposed to play out have you ever looked and seen your future laid out before you, and then something comes into your world and completely wrecks it? Y'all look real holy right now. It's okay. You ever gone into a marriage thinking this is forever, ever, forever, ever, forever, ever? You gonna be it's you and her. Y'all love each other. She looks good. He looks nice. Y'all gonna be together, and then something happens, and next thing you know, you're on the other side. Have you ever had a mindset about how God was going to deliver and bless this business that you started? And you prayed about it. You fasted about it. You studied. You even tithed. And you just know that God's going to take care of it. But something happens and it doesn't work out the way. Am I talking to anybody who's been? If you've been on this earth longer than five minutes, you know what it is to go into something with the best of intentions and have it not turn out the way that you thought it would. And oftentimes our faith gets rattled because we have a mindset of how God operates and we think that we know that God is going to bless us and we have our five little verses that say that I'm the head and not the tail, I'm blessed coming and going, I'm above and not below and we have all these little cliches that we hold on to as Christians and we know that God's going to work everything out and we love Jesus and Jesus loves us and I just know that's my heavenly father and he knows how to give good gifts and I'm his kid so he's going to give me good gifts and I go into this thing and I go into that thing and then all of a sudden my world blows up and I'm wondering what happened and it, it shatters my faith it shocks me to the core and my identity of who God is in my life and how he operates is completely flipped backwards anybody gone through that Daniel is a young boy at the time of his invasion. He's not an infant. He's old enough to remember. He heard stories. He knew about God, the God of creation. He knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the prism of how he viewed God is shattered with the Chaldean invasion. And so what we have to understand is that his mindset is completely rocked from a perspective of a young boy who's growing up with parents that are telling him that God is going to make a way where there is no way. God is faithful. God has chosen us. We are blessed. And all of a sudden, everything that mom and dad told me is a lie because now I'm in captivity. Not only is my identity on the exterior rattled, because my world just changed. But if you got kids in here, this is a real good plug for LTK. They make him a eunuch. The very thing that identifies him as a man is taken from him. What do you do when your world crumbles around you and your identity is destroyed within you? 
What do you do when how everything you view God and know God to be is flipped on its head? His entire world is rocked emotionally, physically, and spiritually, but he resolves. He resolves in his heart that there's a line I'm not going past. You see, you and I have to understand, we make resolutions all the time. I make resolutions every December 31st. We make resolutions all the time. A, res- a resolution, though, is not a vague intention like one of these days, I'm going to clean out that garage. One of these days, I'm going to read the Bible through an ear. It's not one of these vague uh, intentions with no plan, uh, without any clear way of getting it done. A resolve, in a biblical sense, it are intentions with strategies attached to them. You don't just hope something's going to happen. You're planning to make it happen. To be resolved is to be determined. Because a a resolution actually does three things for us. It gives us direction, it gives us purpose, and it gives us foundation. uh, We see in uh, Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's my direction. That's where I got to go. I press towards the mark of the high calling. 2 Corinthians says in 5.11, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. That gives me a purpose. I am to be... Walk in the fear of the Lord and persuade others to join the way and walk in relationship with God. It gives me a foundation in 1 Timothy 4 and 8 for the training of the body is limited benefit. Come on, that helps that tells me I don't need to go to the gym. But godliness is beneficial in every way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That's my foundation of how I operate in the kingdom. But in making resolutions, we have to know one thing. Every resolution that you and I make is going to be challenged. Every, and can I talk to us just for a minute? Some of us have been raised in, 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 in church culture, and we get this mindset that, man, if I come and I have an encounter with God, and I, listen, I believe in breakthrough. I believe God in a moment can, can deliver us and God can heal. And that I have, I grew up in this thing. And I, I remember there are many instances in my life that I can point to, to a service where God was moving and I felt his presence on my life. And that thing that I was battling, I got my answer in that moment. And those are awesome. And I hold on to those. And I'm, I thank God for how I was brought up. But there are other things in my life that I got to keep walking when the euphoria has passed. I got to keep going when the goose pimples have subsided. I know I get excited. I want to be excited. And, man, you know, we, wanna, we, we get fired up on, on, you know, anybody grow up in Sunday night church? Sunday night church, I don't know how much theology we preach, but it was like we're going to get amped. We're going to storm hell with a water pistol. Like we're ready to go. Let's go. Let's do this. And we come out of Sunday night, we're fired up, and we all went to Denny's, because that's what you do when you were saved, and you go to Denny's and be there all night, and all the Christian girls would get a water with a bowl of 1,500 uh, lemons, and they would make ghetto lemonade right there with the sugar, and the servers hated us. But that was like our experience growing up in church as a kid. Y'all, I know y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm speaking your language there. But that's how we were raised in church, and, and we loved Sunday night because it made me feel good. And we loved those services, those experiences, because God was instilling some things in a spiritual environment around a a front podium or platform, and I thank God for those. But oftentimes, as a believer, once we got into Monday and we had to live out the passionate promises that we made on a Sunday, and I didn't have an organ, I didn't have drums, I didn't have shout music, it was a little bit different story living out on Tuesday what I told God I would do for him on Sunday. And what I'm trying to tell some of us as believers is our mindset has to shift from a place of where I am ruled by my emotions, I am ruled by moments of of euphoric highs that we get when we worship together. And let me tell you, that's supposed to happen. Worship's got to be exciting. Worship needs to be fired up because I've been through a lot, and sometimes I just need to get around God's people and just dance a little bit. Sometimes I just need to get in the presence of other believers and just worship and shout and tell Jesus I love you and you're awesome I'm going to give you my best and God you have done so much sometimes praise is exuberant but there are times where my praise isn't my help and I've just got to walk and that's when our resolutions get challenged 
That's where we as believers are put to a test. Will you live out, God? I feel like God is saying, what I've placed inside of you. We have so many Christians that just, they go from week to week, service to service, and they need that shot of, uh, of Jesus juice in their arm, and if they don't get it, man, they struggle. But we, God is looking for believers that are going to live for him on Thursday, just like they said they would on Sunday. They're going to worship him in the pit as much as they worship him in the palace. They're going to worship him in the valley just like they shout on the mountaintop. Because it's through trials that our faith is tested. It's through trials that our faith is purified. And when we come through the test, our faith is, it comes through as pure as gold. A faith that's not tested is a faith that can't be trusted. Let, let, let's, anybody got friends like that? Man, when everything's good, they want to hang out with you. When you're buying, yeah, let's go to Roadhouse. If they're buying, man, we go to Aldi's. Short story, when we were kids, we had this family in our church. There was five of us kids growing up in the house. And my dad, had, my dad helped this, this gentleman in our church, and he was, he was talking a big game. Man, I'm going to bless you. Thank you so much. I'm taking your family out. Uh, I'm going to take your family out to dinner one day after church. And, and, and he took us to McDonald's because in the 80s, that was awesome. McDonald's, McDonald's didn't kill you back then like it, like it does now. You know what I mean? <laughs> You walk by McDonald's and your arteries start to clog. Like back in the 80s, no one cared. And so he took our whole family to McDonald's, and I remember he ordered all of us a little cheeseburger and then small fries for us to split. I was like 10. Do you know what that, that's like, that's just torture. We had a fight in the restaurant. Anyway, that's not, that has nothing to do with my sermon at all. Some of y'all cheap. Pay up. Get large fries for the kids. Come on. I got to get back to my notes. We're lost here. Resolutions are challenged. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Can I tell you all, I know I love Jesus, I do. I really don't like that verse. I was going to mess with it. I know some of y'all are holy. I love every word. No, you don't. That's telling me that trials are guaranteed, and I'm supposed to be happy about it. Not just endure. Not just to walk and complain the whole time. Oh, man, help me. It's going to get quiet. Not just to talk about, well, the devil's beating me up, but glory to his name. You ain't blessing nobody. I am told it is a guarantee that if you live on this earth, you're going to go through some stuff. And I know that we have this prosperity mindset in the church. That says, man, once I give my life to God, we're guaranteed a yacht, a swimming pool, and a white picket fence on two and a half acres. But that's not how Jesus works. Y'all are excited. I can tell y'all going to shout. Someone got their help right there. But for resolutions to be fulfilled, we need the other piece of this, and that's resilience. Resilience from a biblical term, it comes from uh, a, a, a scientific discipline that is rooted in physics. The word originates from two Latin words, re meaning back and salir meaning to jump or to leap. So the literal definition of the word resilient means to bounce back. You got to have a bounce back in your game. You got to have a bounce back in your spirit. If everything that trips you up derails your faith, we need to bring you back and pray you through again because you need a bounce. You and I need a bounce back. You and I have to have an attitude in our spirit that says, Rejoice not against me, O oh, mine enemies, for when I fall, not if I fall, not I'm going to try not to fall, but when I fall. It is a grammatical fact. It is an assurity that you and I are going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to start things out with the best of intentions and have it blow up in our face. We're going to have relationships that we thought we would be BFFs, BFFs forever, and they fall apart. We're going to have relationships that we knew we were put, and they're going to break apart. We are going to fall. It is a promise. It is a guarantee. But will you get up? Will you get your go back? Will you get that yes in your spirit that says, God, it didn't work out like I thought, but you're still faithful. You didn't handle it like I thought you should or could, but you're still on the throne. I know, God, if you'd ask me for my advice, I could really help you, but for 
whatever reason, you choose to mold me as the potter molds the clay. And so me as the clay cannot argue with the potter about what he does with the clay. I am your creation. I am your servant. I am your lo- I'm the lover of your life. God, you have molded me and shaped me. And so I'm going to bless your name. I'm going to give you praise. I'm going to give you worship. I know the circumstances look rough. I know that everything's not okay in my bank account, but I love you, Lord. You are my Lord. I'm your creation, and I'm going to give you worship. Come on, somebody give God a praise right now. You and I have to understand that resilience is a biblical norm. It has to be a biblical norm for Christians. The Bible contains many admonitions to press on, Philippians 3, 13. Overcome hardships and temptations, Romans 12, 21. Persevere in the face of trial, James 1 and 12. It gives us numerous examples of people who suffered greatly but continue to follow God's plan for their lives. Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. I know this is not what you want to hear. I know I'm supposed to come in and give you something that fires, fires us up, and we just shout, and we go out there, and we're ready to go. But some of us, for us to progress, you and I have to learn how to handle falling. We put little kids on the ground, and they crawl. And when they first start walking, it's like first-time parents, they freak out when they stumble, right? But by the third kid, like, they don't care. You just run into the wall. You'll be fine. Walk it off. You know, the first one, they don't let them touch a piece of silverware until they're 19 years old because they're afraid they're going to put it in the outlet. By the third kid, dad's giving them. Let's see. Watch this, guys. He going to learn today. Like, watch it. Like, we understand that as in the natural, we fall. We fail. Anybody remember what it's like to ride a bike? It's going back a few decades for a few years. I got it. It's all right. Remember that first time you took the training wheels off? And you had it, and you told your parents, don't hold me, I got it. And there's like a six-foot-wide oak tree, and guess where you landed? <laughs> and we, we, we get so baffled when things in the natural parallel things in the spiritual. And so we endeavor to go out on our own, and God allows me to fall flat on my face a time or two. And I look up at heaven like, why'd you do that? Because you got to learn. You and I have to learn how to tuck and roll sometimes. God's not going to let me get in a situation where it's going to destroy me. He knows the way I take. He knows the numbers of hair on my head. He's a good father, and he still wants to give good gifts. But sometimes the gift that he needs to give me is not a blessing, but a good failure. It's in failure that my paradigm of him changes. It's in failure and calamity where how I view him is shifted, where I see that he is faithful. There's a difference between talking about the faithfulness of God and understanding the faithfulness of God. But you can't get to understanding without going through some stuff. Can I help you? Those of you that have any ministerial aspirations, get ready for a fight. Get ready for some flops. I tell people all the time, I'm not supposed to say this. You guys know I'm half loony anyway. I tell people I was a youth pastor for two years. I was a terrible youth pastor. Horrible. It was was rough. I came out. I came out. I I had one year of Bible school, so that means I knew everything. And I remember I had like a 40-pound King James Bible you could have killed a deer with. And I had these kids. I was pastoring up in suburbs of Chicago. And, and, and I remember the first, and I, this girl, she'll never know how much she impacted my life. Because I dropped her off after a youth event, and I still get emotional. It's been 20 years. I dropped her off at a youth event, and I've got my little, my little you know, five, you know, Bible school verses, and I've got my 40-pound deer-killing Bible. And I drop her off, and her dad is just smoked up on the, fr- on the front porch. He's high as a kite. And I've got to drop this girl off at, at, at a, at, after a youth event where God touched her. And she sees her father and looks at him. And we know, we know something's off. I don't know what it is, but I know that there's something going on there. And she goes from smiling and elated and happy to put her head down, tears going down her face, and runs into the house. And I was trying to walk her up to the door because I'm a good youth pastor, right? I've had five Bible classes. I know what I'm doing. And I start talking to her dad, and I have no way to connect with him. 
I have no way to connect with her with what she's dealing with on a daily basis. I've got my little Bible school perspective. I've got my King James. I've got all these things that I know in my head work, but none of them actually I've I've never walked out. And so as a youth leader, I'm trying to connect with this girl, and we're not jiving because I don't have the wisdom or the experience to relate to her and talk to her at her level, but I think it's her problem because she's not submitted to God. Can I help you, young ministers? You're going to make mistakes. Walk in it. God is still faithful. You're still going to learn. You're still going to grow. There's gonna, you're going to be better because of the times you fell flat on your face. But keep preaching. Keep praying. Keep preparing. Keep studying. Keep ministering. Keep trying. I know some of you have witnessed the people 900 times and they blow you off and give you the cold shoulder. But isn't it amazing how God will orchestrate things in their life to where they need a shoulder to cry on and someone to talk to and you're the name that shows up in their head. But we can't get in that situation if we quit. We've got to be willing to fail. You and I got to be willing to go through pain. Paul shows great resilience after his life-altering encounter with Jesus in Acts 9. When he was transformed from a religious Pharisee into a radical Christian, many people weren't happy. They weren't excited about his conversion. And we see in 2 Corinthians where he's beaten, stoned, criticized, jailed, and nearly killed. One incident especially shows Paul's exceptional resilience. In Lystra, in Asia Minor, he was stoned, dragged out of town, left for dead. But when his enemies left, Paul simply gets up and goes back into the city. And you and I get hurt when someone doesn't like our post on Facebook. I'm preaching way better than y'all are amen. We get offended over the smallest things. And because, listen, how do I say, offenses are going to come. <laughs> offenses are going to happen. Get ready. I know this is shouting, y'all, man, we got the victory. Yeah, offenses, they're waiting for you outside. How do we respond to offense? Because can I tell you, Paul says in the New Testament, if I prophesy with eloquent words, but I don't have love, if we talk about how Christian we are and we don't have love, if I talk about how great Jesus is and I don't have love, if I talk about how blessed I am but I don't have love, we, we <laughs> love is so hard. It's so much harder than we think it is. That means I got to love people even when they don't like me. I got to love people that talk bad about me. I got to love people that say, man, what's wrong with him? He's crazy. I got to love people that told, that told my family that we were crazy for moving to Jackson, Tennessee and joining Love and Truth. I'll get to where you're at. Hang tight. I have to love people that went to my father-in-law behind my back and said things about me. And I have to, I've been on staff at a church that I love and has saved us. And, and we hear people talking. This is probably too raw if this is on YouTube, whatever. But we had to go back and I've got to love those people. I, is, can I, is it okay to love people you don't like? Anybody ever gone through that? I love you, but I don't like you right now. Spouses, don't elbow your spouse. It's okay. Part of this Christian faith, I'm trying to summarize this is to make the impact that God has called us to make. You and I have to be willing to put ourselves out there. Church growth, revival, whatever term you want to call it. I believe God works through men and women. I believe there are moments in Scripture, we see it in Scripture, we see it throughout history, where there are sovereign moves of the Holy Spirit, where God just blows into a region. And I, and I want to be a part of those. I love those. I think that love and truth is in a season of revival. Guys, we've seen stuff in Dyersburg. I, I would love, you know, I've had people, what are y'all doing? Nothing. We, we're not doing anything different. It is just God is doing some stuff there. You know, people want to ask questions about, man, you guys did this, that, and the other. We were averaging 78 people in December. And overnight, we, we had 167 last Sunday. But that don't, that's for Jesus. That ain't me, 
because I've done it on my own. I've seen me mess it up. I, I know I make mistakes. I know I'm crazy because I've seen me do crazy, dumb things. And what that does, I've seen myself fail. And I've seen myself fall. I've seen myself falter. I've seen myself have a bad attitude and a bad spirit and handle things wrong. And in those moments, I could get really insecure and say, well, God didn't call me. No, God called me. God laid out and orchestrated our steps to get us to where we're at. The thing that we did, the thing that y'all are doing, the thing that many of y'all are doing, you just keep showing up. There is something that you're going to, there are some breakthroughs that come with just our yes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to wrap up because I'm going to keep going if you guys, go ahead, if you want to play keys or whatever. I know this isn't hermeneutically or hakaletically or whatever the preaching terms is. I don't know. I got a D in that class. My wife and I, we got mar- when we got married in 2010, I had, I had grown up in church. Um, I had a... How do I say this? I was kind of one of them half in, half out kids. And I remember I went to Bible school because I was trying to escape a lifestyle that I was going down. And so whenever, you, whenever something is birthed that is unhealthy, it, it, you know, we can pray over it, but unhealthy, unhealthy beginnings produce unhealthy fruit, if I can say it like that. And so I went through a lot of stuff in my life, and I, I got bitter about God. I got bitter about church. You know how we are. You know, some of y'all, I know you, y'all look good tonight. Not all y'all are as holy as you're putting out right now. It's okay. But I went through a season where I was angry at God, bitter at God, bitter at ministry, bitter at church folk. I felt like there, there, I had friends that were not in church that were better friends to me not having a relationship with Jesus than my friends in church. Does that make sense? Anybody else gone through stuff like that? It's okay to have questions like that, Everybody? Man, y'all got some good friends, okay. And so uh, through the course of events, I, st- I started coming back to church and, and, and you know, working my way back in. And, and God was dealing with me th- with, with a lot of stuff that I had al- allowed into my life and, and, and started going to church again. And, and God really got a hold of me. Um, I was 30 years old when God really got a hold of my life. And I said, okay, I'm all in. I'm going to do whatever. Uh, I got to deal with, you know, I need you in my life. And, and I'm at my wife at, at church, uh, and, and it, it was, you know, we knew pretty much early on, man, this is it. And, and I remember our second date, we were at a Smoky Bones in, in Indianapolis, and we were just having some barbecue, and, and we're still getting to know each other. And it, it's one of those things where we're, you know, how much do I want to share with her? And she's like, how much do I want to share? You know how it is, anyone that's ever dated like that, you, you don't want to show them the real you just yet, okay? Like you want her to stick around for date three through nine, you know? Um, and, and so I remember we were talking about church, and she had a similar upbringing. And, and I said, I, 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 she said, do you have any aspirations to be in ministry? And I said, no, not at all. I, I want to go to church. I think church is important. And we, we, we did a pinky swear. That's, that's how we signed it back in the day. I don't know what that means. But we, we pinky swore over buffalo wings, you know. And I said, I, you know, I, I want to be in ministry. And so fast forward, we get married and for some reason, I still, I still don't know why. We, we were going away on our honeymoon, but we had a two-day buffer between our wedding date and, and our honeymoon. And so we decided, I don't know why, I said, let's go to church. We got married on a Saturday. We're going to go to church on a Sunday. And there was a, a gentleman there that operates in the prophetic, and I didn't know him. He didn't know me. Um, but he decides to start praying. And he calls us out, and he turns to the pastor who is my pastor, and he says, this guy's leaving in five years. And I had a stroke because I liked where I was at. I ain't going nowhere. What do you mean I'm leaving in five years? And it was amazing. And, and I have to tell this about my wife. I wish she was here today because she'll tell you. For the next five years, God really started dealing with us. But can I tell you, there were a lot of moments in that five years that I, I did not want to hear about that prophecy. I did not want to receive that word. And my wife, she held on to that word. We're here today because of Andrea. Let, let's get that straight. She loves Jesus a whole lot better than I do. We, she held on to that word, and she would bring it up. Remember what the prophet spoke? And it would be year two, and it would be year three, and I'm struggling at a job. And, you know, I didn't, I, I, we struggled for a few years when we first got married. And, and 
Year three, she'd pull out, remember the word of the prophet. Year four, remember the word of the prophet. And I finally just smirked when five years and one week, we were moving to Dallas, Texas to join staff at a church there. Five years and one week, we left our church and moved to join staff. And that would be a great story. And that would be amazing. And I could tell that, man, look at the word of the Lord coming to fruition. But what God didn't tell me and what we didn't hear in that prophetic voice was that when we got to Texas, it started three years of some of the most difficult life that we had gone through. We were in the ministry. We were serving a church. We loved Jesus. And on a personal note, I felt like everything I was trying was backfiring. Everything I needed to do was failing at a colossal level. And I was questioning my calling. I was questioning my faith. I was questioning, God, what am I even doing here? We had conversations about we need to go back home to Indiana where we got married, and I'm going to get a job at so-and-so. And we stayed in Texas for two years, and we had an opportunity. And I hope this is okay, guys, just me sharing my story. We had an opportunity to join a staff back in Indiana, and we thought, man, the Lord has provided this is awesome. Now we're going to be home. I'm, I'm within two hours of my family. She's close to home. You know, she's a, a daddy's girl. We were close to her parents. And what happened is we go back home, and it starts the worst year of our life. We were praying. We were believing. Andrew was praying more than me. I was mad. <laughs> we went through absolute hell for 12 months. And I don't want to go into detail. It, it, it was terrible. And I remember telling God, I'm going to give you six months and I'm done. If you don't open a door, I'm done. And I, I meant it. And my wife, she, she continued. This is more, I, I let, let, I've got to get somebody to recognize and understand. It's okay to have doubt. You're not human if you don't have doubt. We walk by faith, not by sight. And so sometimes it just means putting my foot out there and putting weight on it, not knowing where it's going to land. That's faith. You know why? Because if I knew everywhere I took a step how it was going to end out, I would start believing my own hype. And you and I have to understand that God is not going to share praise with anybody else. And so at the end of the day, it wasn't that God abandoned us. It wasn't that we made wrong decisions. I really believe this. God orchestrated us to go to Texas and get beat up for a couple years. Because it, there were some parts of me that had to die out. And it was orchestrated that God allowed us to go back to Indiana for a year and get the stupid out of us. Because there was a little bit more of me that, he, that had to die out. There were some things in myself that I didn't know were there. And let me tell you, I don't care how much you pray fast, talk in tongues. Let your life get pressed in the right spot, and God will reveal some things inside of you that you didn't even know were there. I know we're all holy, and we know the songs, and Jesus on the main line, and we know all these great verses and all this stuff. I took you back there, didn't I? We, we, we know all the things to say to put up this front like we are just good, Bible-believing, Bible -believing, saved Christians, but let some certain circumstances come into our life and there's a side of you and I that will come out that we're like we didn't know was there but God didn't do that so he could kill us he wants to purify us and the only way that your faith and my faith can be purified is through a trial you know what's amazing about Daniel is he makes the resolution that he's not going to take of the king's meat and drink. And he goes back to the head of the eunuchs. This blew my mind when I felt like the Lord dropped it in my spirit. He goes back to the guy that on the order of another guy took the most valuable thing in terms of his personal identity from him. And he says... I have resolved in my heart I'm not going to eat of the meat, and God gives him favor. He went to the very guy that probably oversaw him becoming a eunuch at the orders of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. After that pain, that emotional turmoil, the season of 
where his mindset is completely shifted and rattled, he goes right back and says, I'm not taking another inch back. And because of that, in Daniel 2, Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar that nobody else can interpret. In chapter 3, we see the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew boys. Chapter 4, Daniel interprets another dream. Nebuchadnezzar's pride, uh, it, it centers around Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's pride, and Nebuchadnezzar is driven to madness. In chapter 4, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, has the handwriting on the wall, and uh, Daniel can interpret Belshazzar is murdered. We see in Daniel that verse 21 lets us know that Daniel was in the king's court from the time that uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded with the Chaldeans up until the year of King Cyrus. I believe that God would never have allowed Daniel to have that much uh, influence over three kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and King Cyrus, without his resolution. You and I need to make resolutions. But with our resolutions has to come a, a resilience that can only be through the power of the Holy Spirit that gets us back up when we fall. Because you and I are going to fall. Nobody shouted on that. It's okay. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Because when I fall, I shall arise. So what resolutions do you need to make? Let's stand. There's something physical that you need to resolve. Is there something physical that you need to make a resolution today that you're going to abstain from? I grew up in a church culture. I felt like the only two sins were drinking and smoking. You got a lot worse stuff than that right now. Please understand what I'm saying. Are there certain websites that you need to resolve? Can I, is that too close to home? Is there certain chat rooms that you need to resolve? You need to make a resolution. I'm not going to do this anymore. Is there some emotional things that you need to make resolutions about? I'm not going to allow certain people to have influence over me. Are there some mindsets that you have to make resolutions about? I am who God says I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't care what you say about me. Jesus thinks pretty highly of me. You can think I'm goofy up here preaching all day long. You didn't call me. God did. And so in the seasons of life where maybe I don't think I'm doing as well, can I help you? One of the things that helps me so much, and maybe this will help you, I don't know. This isn't, I am not leaning on my own talent. Thank the Lord. I'm leaning on his calling and his anointing. And so those moments that I get insecure before I get on stage at Dyersburg or I get to preach here, I was fretting in my hotel room today. I know I look all cool, cool, calm, and collected right now, but this takes a lot of effort. This just doesn't happen. I was stressing today about preaching this here. Because I want to come in and I want to be encouraging and say, man, God is going to do this and God's going to do that and you're going to be blessed and God's getting ready to take you to the next level and God's going to deliver you and he's going to show himself strong. I want to do that so badly. But I got to get up here and preach about how, hey, you and I are going to fail. And don't let your failure define you. Because right now, the harvest is ripe but the laborers are few. And we've got too many called people that are qualified, that God has anointed, that God has blessed with giftings and talents, but it didn't work out the way that they thought, and they walked away from their calling, and there's people that are lost and dying and going to hell. If only our, we as believers would reach out to them. So what are the resolutions you need to make in your life? Are you willing to fail? Because let me help you, and I'm going to close with this. 
It's in my weakness that his strength is made perfect. Guys, I know we have this idea of how men should be. We're going to be tough. We're going to be... You want to impress God with your manliness? Pray. You want to move heaven and earth? Not my will, but thine, Lord. That's the hardest prayer to pray. Not my will, but thine. Because my will is exalt me. I'm pastor somebody. Ladies, pray. Cry out to God. Intercede. I know y'all want to figure it out. My wife's an event planner. Help me, Jesus. She asked me questions I didn't even think that, I, I would never thought of. And it frustrates me because I feel so dumb. <laughs> but the thing that gives us breakthrough is when we say, God, we lean on your calling, your anointing. You put us here. You could have delivered us from this. You could have walked us around it. But there are things that need to be developed in us that we only get to see act out when we go through something. And so if you want to make some resolutions, I know that, I know that you guys have been through a lot. But God's not done with you. There's a breakthrough coming. There's going to be greater. The influence that you had, I don't know, I'm just talking. The influence that you had is going to be exponentially magnified because of the things you guys were willing to go through. And the fact that you just stayed committed and you stayed faithful, God is obligated by his word to honor the faithfulness. And listen, I know that there's people that aren't here right now, and I hate that for you, but it wasn't their law, it wasn't your loss. They missed an opportunity for the breakthrough that is coming, for the revival that's coming, for the influence that you're gonna have, for the miracles that are gonna take place, for the signs and wonders that are gonna be delivered. God is obligated to honor, if nothing else, it's faithfulness. So if you want to make some resolutions, up front's open right now. Prayer team, if you're here, wherever your prayer team at, come on up front. I think we need to have a one-on-one -on -one chat. I'm not going to hype this up. We're not going to sit here and try to get the Hammond B3 going. Some of us need to have personal conversations with Jesus Christ right now and say, God, you put me here, and I ain't quitting. There is nowhere in the Bible that it's okay to quit. Heard a preacher preach a sermon one time. You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. Nowhere in the Bible is it okay to quit. God is wanting to develop things in us. Let me pray over you, and I'm going to turn it back over here. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, I pray that what I said blessed somebody and resonated with somebody. This is your word. I didn't want to preach this, God. But, Lord, I know that you have given me a word for this house today. And God, I pray, Holy Spirit, you just speak to hearts right now. God, I pray right now that people under the sound of my voice will feel a leading and a prompting from your spirit to come up front and make a resolution in our life, that they're going to stay faithful to you, they're going to be committed to you, and that word that you've placed in their heart, that thing that you spoke into them that brings them all sorts of fear and anxiety, that's all going to dissipate, and they're going to walk forward in the assurance, God, that you're going to see them through. It doesn't mean that the journey is going to be absent of any hurt, absent of any failure or calamity, but God, you're greater than any trial, you're greater than any failure failure, you're greater than any calamity, and you're going to bring them through. And when they come through the trial, we know that in the word of God, it says that we're made overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But we can't have a testimony without a test, God. So we're going to worship you in the test. We're going to worship you in the trial. We're going to stay faithful in the struggle, God, because we know struggle produces strength, and our influence grows when we walk through the fires, Lord Jesus. We thank you, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, come minister right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.